What's mine is yours Through rain or shine Through thick and thin You and I will get along Cause we keep putting in Hello everyone! Hello everyone, welcome to People Helping People. We'll give everyone a chance to tune in. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special conversation. We're very excited to be joined by our special guests, our cosmic clown, Wavy Gravy. Hi, Wavy and Ja. You guys um, are muted, we'll unmute you in a second so you can just wave. And then we have epidemiologist and activist, Dr. Larry Brilliant is joining us here as well. And the lovely ladies of the Ace of Cups who can all wave our little parade wave. And then we'd like to introduce some very special guests that are out there doing incredible things in the world. So we have Denise Sandoval, who's the founder of Lava May. Thank you for joining us. We have Deanna Cohen, the co-founder of the Plastic Pollution Coalition. We have humanitarians and activists Bob and Natasha Weir. Thank you so much for coming. And then we have what I like to refer to as the protectors of my sanity. So we have Dharma teacher, author, and activist Jack Hornfield and Trudy Goodman. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And we have the founders of Walk the Walk 2020, an organization that you'll learn more about today. So we have Seth Fleischer here and Dr. Emily Baldwin will be joining us later during their segment. Guiding our conversation today is Michelle Ezrick. Michelle is a social activist and award-winning filmmaker, including Wavy Gravy's movie, Saint Misbehaving. Not that Wavy would ever misbehave. Um, and you can catch that streaming. Johnny doesn't misbehave, right? No. Um, you can catch that streaming on Amazon Prime. Um, and then Michelle's new movie, her current film, Cracked Up, is the story of Daryl Hammond. And it's an incredibly moving piece. I highly recommend checking it out. And that is trending on Netflix now. And one of the cool things about Michelle she can talk about a little later is she helped pass legislation into law for trauma-informed care to be incorporated into substance abuse treatment. So she's done a lot of work helping people heal. And Michelle, we're so glad to have you here. Thank you so much for joining our conversation. And I will turn it over to you and uh, again, thank you everyone for being here and we hope you leave you feeling informed and uplifted today. Thank you, Larry. So many of my beloved friends help me unmute myself so they can hear me and see me. And I am very happy to be here with all of you. Um, let's just jump into the inspiration for this gathering, which uh, is Wavy Gravy's song, Basic Human Needs. And we're gonna watch the video that he made with the Ace of Cups. And here it comes. Maybe. It's coming. The video is supposed to be playing. Wavy, we need a tweener line. In India, they say your dinner is just now coming. Uh, 
There we go. Climb to tower. I went into space. One, two, one, two, three, four. So Wavy and Jahanara, uh, obviously being that I made a film about you, I know a few things about you both. Wavy, you wrote this song in the early 70s during the Vietnam War when we, the United States, bombed Bak Mai Hospital on Christmas Day. Can you tell us how that occurred? Wavy's muted. Hold on, Waves. Okay. Am I talking? You're talking. We hear you now. Thanks. Okay, you have some gravy on your ears. 
It seems like it was almost yesterday, 50 years ago, that B-52s blew up the largest teaching hospital in Southeast Asia. And I was devastated in my little wart in the Santa Cruz mountains. And I watched my hand write basic human needs. It was uh, into my phone book. <laughs> and uh, it, it was out of body, totally. My hand was uh, on its own. <laughs> And I got to watch it do this. And it was a miracle. And that's the, that's the tune. It's a miracle. Thank you, Avi. It's, it's a gift to all of us, basic human needs. So thank you so much. Diane and Mary Ellen, how did the Ace of Cups come to record basic human needs? Diane, you're muted. Diane, you're muted. Unmute yourself. Well, there she is. There we are. Well, hey. my heart was so touched the first time I heard Wavy sing Basic Human Needs, and I felt the world needed to see and hear the song. And uh, when the band started recording, I suggested we bring Wavy into the studio to sing his song and with his ectar, ectar. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Did you actually tune that thing? Many strings <laughs> never in tune. One string, sometimes I get lucky. Do we have Mary Ellen on board? Oh. Yeah, um, we what happened is our great, really great producer, Dan Shea, came up with the arrangement, how it was put together. Uh, Denise wrote the background vocals, and we were supported by an incredible gospel group that Dan brought in, people that he knew. Then Jesse Block filmed the video, and um, we just, uh, that we just watched, and the track is on our new album, Sing Your Dreams. And we're really thrilled that we have it on this album. We're really thrilled about that. Me Thank too. You. Thank you. It's a it's a beautiful video, and uh, mm -hmm. thanks for bringing it to life. Um, Wavy and Larry, when you guys first met, we know it was love at first sight, as you say in the Wavy Gravy movie, Larry. Uh, and then we show a picture of Wavy in his uh, all-star cast up to here. Um, it's going to be hard for you guys to talk about your friendship for 50 years, but... Uh, you want, uh, want to know the story, how we first met? Yes, tell us the story. It was uh, in a P Warner Brothers movie uh, production site on uh, like Pier 33 or something like that, or Pier 30 one and a quarter, you know, a little bit like Hogworth, uh, I guess. And um, uh, the idea was to get uh, a lot of rock bands and uh, recreate in reverse the pilgrims coming to America from England. And we were gonna, in some crazy fantastic way, we were gonna go backwards from uh, Haight-Ashbury and go back to Glastonbury and then go to uh, Canterbury uh, and of course, we'd have to live in buses and do rock concerts. Wavy was the master of ceremonies at all the rock festivals. I was the rock doc. Mm -hmm. And we were all assembled uh, to meet uh, with uh, Tom Donahue, who was going to be the producer, and uh, Stone Ground, which was the, one of the bands, and Mylon Melvin. And we were meeting together at the Warner Brothers lot. Uh, and all these buses were coming together and we were all going along and saying hello and everybody looked pretty normal for the 60s, which may not be normal, but it was normal for the 60s. And then I saw over there in the corner uh, a fellow who was dressed in what seemed rather unconventional uh, attire. Uh, for starters, he was wearing a duck bill hat with a real duck's real bill. 
So I knew there was something unusual about him. And then he gave me a big smile and there was a rainbow smile because just like an Asgard, Asgard, he had a rainbow bridge. I mean, there it is, camera zoom in. I mean, all of his teeth had been tied <laughs> in a Bib Gior, Roy G. Bib rainbow. So when he smiled, he gave you the rainbow. So I, I immediately was beginning to understand that this was not an ordinary human being with his rainbow <laughs> and his duck bill hat and his jumpsuit that uh, uh, Jahanara, who was then Bonnie Jean, had made for him. Uh, and uh, it had all sorts of rainbows all over it and patches and uh, different wonderful insignia. And I went up and I started talking to Wavy, uh, introducing myself, uh, thinking that it would be about a minute or two. And it seemed like uh, 50 years later, that conversation has never stopped. Interestingly, <laughs> for me personally, my first job when meeting the hog farm and meeting all the cast was because we were going to go international this will come up later. Um, and there was a lot of smallpox around. My first job was to vaccinate everybody. Uh, this is 1971 against smallpox. And the first time I really met Wavy was when he put out his arm so that I could vaccinate him against smallpox. Um, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been, if you'll, Bobby, a very long, strange trip indeed. Yeah. So Wavy and Ja, have been married for almost 53 years. 53, almost 54. Almost 54. And Girage and I, and Girage is not here because she's in a Buddhist retreat and she sends her uh, loving metta to everybody, but she can't talk or do any of the, the things for seven more days. Um, but uh, for our 50th anniversary, Wavy sent us a note. I wish I would have brought it in. And it said, uh, Larry, you and I have been friends for 50 years. Uh, ja and Gurdjieff have been friends for 50 years. Ja and Wavy have been married for 53 years. Larry and Gurdjieff have been married for 50 years. That's more than 200 fucking years. <laughs> <laughs> My name marches on. Proven yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one of the most touching stories you told me, Larry, um, when I interviewed you for the Wavy film was, and this is, you know, Dr. Larry Brilliant, who I say he helped to eradicate smallpox in India and so much more. Um, you have had incredible titles, but Larry said, the greatest title that I have ever had is being Wavy Gravy's best friend because he read it. <laughs> the newspaper he was reading a newspaper and he happened to be over the, somebody's house and it said in the newspaper larry told me this and wavy gravy's best friend was there larry brilliant so in the movie his lower third is larry brilliant wavy gravy's best friend <laughs> but wavy and job you know showing that hippies can stay married for a long time um do you want to say what is the secret of a long marriage don't, Don't get, get divorced. divorced. <laughs> it's the only secret. That's it. <laughs> Unless you really, need, if you really need to. If you really need to, you can. But the secret to being married for a long time is staying married. You work through it when it comes up. <laughs> um, back to you, uh, Larry. You're our most trusted source regarding all things pandemic. Right now, 75% of the country is spiking with new cases. 230,000 have died. And we just recorded 80,000 new cases in one day, the most since the pandemic began. The White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, said that we can't control the virus. What does that mean? And if a new administration is elected, God willing, one that relies on science and cares about its people, what do you see as a way forward for all of us? I was on a call this morning at 4.30 a.m. Uh, from Geneva with uh, folks from the World Health Organization. And uh, they would remind us that it's a 
pandemic, and we should be looking at all the world that's affected, especially the countries which are the poorest, the weakest. Um, uh, there have been over half a million new cases of COVID today worldwide. There have been over a million deaths worldwide already from COVID. Uh, we are at almost a quarter of a million and we are about 20% of all the deaths in the world, which is important because we're only 6% or 5% of the population. Uh, this is not something that we want to um, specialize in, or this is not a, a contest that we want to win. And in fact, um, there are some troubling times ahead of us. Uh, we're going into a season uh, where this disease is almost a latitude-based disease. The higher latitudes where it's colder um, have spiked the first because it, it gets cold, you go indoors, and the things that you did in the summer outdoors, you now do indoors. And we're going to have Halloween and Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, um, Hanukkah. And all these holidays are naturally uh, opportunities for us to get together with people that we love and hug them and, and spread COVID. And so there's nothing to stop this disease for a little while. Um, I was interested to see that San Francisco is the safest and the most successful city in the United States in battling COVID. And uh, there have been many research articles on why that is. But the major reason that it has the lowest death rate and the lowest case rate is that 90% of people wear face masks all the time and practice social distancing. Those two things alone will protect us. We don't have to get this disease if we practice those things. And if we practice social distancing and wearing face masks, we'll be preventing that disease from affecting not only people we love, but who they love and who they love and who they love and people you don't even know will be saved by your selfless act of wearing a goddamn face mask. Um, uh, I think that while it is going to be a tough time for the next three or four months, as we turn into the spring, things are going to get a lot better. Um, Tony Fauci, uh, just a few minutes ago on CNN, said that we might not see the world become normal again until the end of 2021 or the middle of 2022. But actually, beginning in the spring, it's going to start getting almost normal. Uh, if you think about what normal used to mean when we all had to have those little yellow cards in order to travel, the yellow card said, you've been vaccinated against smallpox and cholera and yellow fever. Remember that? You couldn't travel without that yellow card. Well, we're going to have that yellow card again except it'll probably be a Coachella bracelet or a Google with Apple app on your phone. That's normal-ish to have something like that that shows that you've been vaccinated or you've had the disease or in some other way, you're not going to spread the disease. And it's gonna be normal because while we have done the worst job in the world at creating tests for this disease, and there's over 150 tests now in the market in the United States, I would guess about 100 of them are not very good. Um, still, the development is happening so quickly that by the springtime, I'm pretty confident there'll be a $10, 10-minute 10 home test for COVID, like the pregnancy test, and we'll be able to test ourselves every day and know that we are not a risk to others. Those two things that, that those two things alone will make the world more normal. Those are the yellow cards or those apps and those tests. But add on top of that, we will have vaccines. There are over 150 vaccines in trials right now. There's five in China, one in the Soviet Union. We've got a dozen in the US. Of those four are leading candidates. They're in the ending stages of what's called phase three. That means they've already shown that they are effective in creating immunity. 
And right now we're trying to figure out how effective and how safe. I'm very optimistic that of that dozen, of that 150, of those leading four, we will wind up with not one, but many vaccines that will be effective and will be safe. It, I think it's gonna take a little longer than people think to know that because safe to me means that rare side effects only happen once every million vaccinations. And you can't test only 30,000 people and know what's gonna happen once in a million. It just doesn't work that way. So I think it's gonna take a little while to know how safe these are. But I don't know, uh, looking at this demographic, I bet some of you have had the shingles vaccine. Is that right? Have you had the shingles vaccine, anybody? How many got the first shingles vaccine? Mm -hmm. And then of you, how many got the second one? I think it's gonna be like that with COVID vaccines. We're gonna get one and then find there's a better one. So put all these things together. We are gonna have treatments. We already have a few. We know about the steroids that really shorten the duration of the disease. We know about the monoclonal antibodies that really help. We're gonna have vaccines. We're gonna have these tests, these point of care diagnostics. We're gonna have vaccines. Mm -hmm. All gonna wear masks for a while. Um, that's what I mean by it's going to be kind of normal. But what will be the most important thing? This pallor, this PTSD that we have every day, uh, this uh, idea that we are consumed by this despair, that will lift. We will find that we will have conversations about beauty and love and music and not only COVID and this orange orangutan in the White House. That too will pass. And when those two things pass, we will have not only a normal life, we'll have joy and happiness and fun. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to a really great summer. Um, we may not have full normal, but we will have something that's kick-ass and wonderful. Ooh, kick my wonderful ass. <laughs> thank you Larry thank you and thank you for helping me when I had COVID in March and you were texting me in the hospital and you're the you're the only one I trust so when I when I'm watching everybody I say I don't know the only one I trust is Dr. Larry Brilliant so thank God thank you. good um money so, hey, Michelle, yeah. yes I, wavy should tell you Tell us all about the magical mush, magical uh, bus trip that we took uh, from uh, uh, Canterbury after a pro uh, after a Pink Floyd concert. Uh, we drove all the way to Kathmandu. Yes, and you can also see that trip in the Wavy Gravy movie. Go right now. Uh, no, <laughs> but Wavy, you want to talk about that? But I'll go out and buy that movie, though, for sure. It's yes, it's it, it's amazing because uh, there I was on the, on the roof of the bus driving over the Khyber Pass, and uh, they're filming it. So I know that someday in the far future, I'll be able to see myself on the roof of the bus driving over the Khyber Pass. Mm, thank you, Michelle, for <laughs> piecing it all together. And our grandchildren will be able to see it in their college classes of recent history. Yes, oh. yes, absolutely. Thank you. Help us remember that it happened. Yeah, yeah. No, Kurt Vonnegut said it best. He said, history is a list of surprises. And we were certainly that. <laughs> <laughs> so Dallas, please uh, introduce our next guest. I'd love to. Well, as the song says, wouldn't it be neat if the people that you meet had shoes upon their feet and something to eat? And wouldn't it be fine now if all humankind had shelter? Um, our, next, um, our next guest is um, Donise Sandoval. She's the founder of Lava May, an, organiz an organization committed to radical hospitality, making sure every person moving through homelessness has a one-stop access to critical services. Donise, 
what do you say to people who want to help with homelessness, but they just don't know what to do or know how? Given the climate of these times, are you feeling despair or are you hopeful? Thank you, Dallas. Great question. Um, I think there's something in our human psyche that tells us that whatever we do has to be these huge grand gestures. You know, we started by converting a public transportation bus into showers and toilets on wheels. But I think one of the beautiful gifts I've gotten from doing this work for the past seven years is to see how the small, tiny things make so much difference to look a person in the eye and to acknowledge them, to greet them, to say hello, particularly if the person is unhoused and on the street because they are, we, so many of you know, the people in our society view them as outcasts and outliers and not our neighbors, which, what, which is exactly what they are. So to take a moment and have that true personal human to human connection, which is what radical hospitality is about. It's about extraordinary care and it, it shouldn't have to be called extraordinary care. It should simply be the way that every single one of us and, um, is interacting with the people within our circle. Uh, there's this wonderful meditation and, and it's about connection. And it says, anybody comes within five feet of you, say good morning, say hello, make that connection to remember that you were acknowledged and that you were seen. And Brene Brown talks so much about belonging and how critical it is for us to thrive and to um, live beautiful lives. And so we must create that belonging. That is my call. That's my quest in life is that we extend true radical hospitality to each other. And it's sometimes challenging to do it to people who we don't necessarily have naturally warm feelings for. I think of, as Dr. Brilliant said, the orange orangutan in the White House. Um, but on some level, even he is deserving if we believe that everyone has value of radical hospitality. Yes, well, Ram Dass, our friend Ram Dass had um, Trump on his altar, so. Uh, he's a he's a power of example. He's much more evolved than me. Um, so uh, you know, connection is the opposite of trauma. It is connection is the opposite of suicide. Connection is the opposite of addiction. Uh, it is really all about connection and love. And thank you for speaking about that. Thank you. Um, Wavy wrote, wouldn't it be grand if we all lent a hand? And wouldn't it be daring if we all started sharing? Natasha and Bob, you have used your high visibility to lend a hand to share and advocate for the planet and for humanitarian initiatives such as headcount and voting. You've always, as Kesey said, put your good where it does the most. Where are you focusing most these days? A couple places, actually. Thank you, by the way. Um, first off, uh, and I think the, the most pressing issue is uh, the, the coming of election. And uh, what, we've, uh, what I've been working, I've been working with an outfit called Head Count now for 10, 12 years, something like that. Um, we have, uh, we just passed a milestone. Um, this last week, we, uh, we finally uh, passed the uh, point where we've uh, registered a, a million voters. Um, almost half a million in this last, in this last cycle. So that's enormous, I think. That's huge. And um, I, I'm real thrilled about that. It's, uh, it's what is what we envisioned when we when we started pacing this this outfit together, and in uh, the vast majority of those people that we are, you know, like ninety five percent of those people that we uh, we registered, uh, we keep on them. By the way, we keep we keep on those folks. We we make sure that they register, that they stay registered, particularly in states where uh, where. They purge the voter rolls if uh, if uh, if they suspect you might be voting s somehow uh, against what they think 
people should vote for. And um, and so we keep we keep we keep on them. We keep on the people that we registered. We keep in touch with them and, and make sure that uh, they're they they look into it and, and find out if they're still registered. And if not, they they we tell them how to go and, and get re-registered. And then we're gonna and then we're gonna stay on them about uh, making sure they actually get off their butts and vote. Now, what this what this amounts to is that the, the vast majority of, uh, of them, like I say, 95% are young folks. We register them in, uh, in uh, at, at shows and uh, they come out to see music and, uh, and, and we get them, you know, my, my daughter, for instance, uh, spent her summers uh, when she was, you know, 12, 14, it's her first job. 16. It was her first job was going out and collaring people and, and registering them to vote. Mm -hmm. And um, and they couldn't say no to her because uh, you know she's she was she's adorable she's young and she's you know <laughs> full of life and and spunk and uh, and but there's something that carries through these people are young they have their lives in front of them so voting to them is more important than for some somebody my age who's uh, who's you know retired and working on his golf game and just wants to make sure his, uh, his taxes are low. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, this is breaking news. You're working on your <laughs> golf game? <laughs> He's not. I'm not working it's on my golf game. Anyway. <laughs> it's, it's just a line. It's just a line. And I think we're seeing that now that not only are they voting, but they're making sure that they vote early enough so that uh, despite the fact that our uh, our esteemed president has been trying to shut down the post the post office that that their their votes have plenty of time to get to the polls uh, on time and get counted and the larger picture is that all these kids are you know this is the first time in my lifetime even, even if you if you take into consideration uh, Barack Obama's uh, uh, first, th this is the first time that kids have shown a real, a real big interest in the de democratic principle, and I think that may be I think that may stick with them for for years to come, and I think it's going to have to because um, uh, we're going to see our friends the Repubs uh, try to try to try to litigate away probably in, in all likelihood the, the most massive landslide in our lifetimes, electoral landslide in our lifetimes. And I think they're going to try to take that to court and litigate it away. Yeah. And, um, and so if that happens, what are we going to do? Well, I, I think we're going to have to let the kids figure that out because whatever you know, whatever they come up with, I get. I, I'm willing to bet it's going to work because it's something that our friends the Republicans wouldn't be re wouldn't think of and won't be ready for. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we'll just we'll just see. We you know. I don't know how far they're going to try to get with litigating away a landslide loss in their case, um, but you know they're going to try. Absolutely. Do you want to talk about the social dilemma? Now, there's another there's another issue that uh, I wanted to get into, and that has to do with a movie that's currently out now. Um, uh, Diana, your movie is uh, is eye opening. Um, this is a new one that's eye-opening as well, and it's uh, it's as big a problem. Only it's more a cerebral problem than a, a physical one, although it, it it has physical manifestations. The movie is called a Social Dilemma. Yeah, and uh, it's a it's a documentary. It's available on Netflix. I I urge all of you to see it because uh, if if you aren't if you aren't part of that problem, at least you should at least understand it. And what it does is it breaks down the economic um, engine that drives social media. And, uh, 
and it, it explains to you why social media does what it does, how it does what it does, and um, and what the end result of that is. For instance, this uh, this this polarization of uh, uh, American culture and society is a is a product very much of social media, where if you exhibit, you know, social media is watching you, and they're watching your 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 tastes and your uh, the choices you make and they make sure that you get nothing but that and more and stuff more like that um and so for instance if you uh, if you like what is it QAnon or whatever that that, that outfit is called right they'll, QAnon. Feed, they'll they'll feed you a steady diet of that kind of stuff and you'll hear about nothing else mm -hmm. uh if you like left-wing stuff that's you know marxist and, 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 and stuff like that they'll make sure that you find you hear about nothing else and so once you've lived in that in the world that's really of your making that uh you're making that that salted in with the fact that uh your your tastes your proclivities your uh your interests take you in that direction and uh and social media will enforce that direction in you, it's no wonder that we don't speak the same language, that we don't share the same fact, we don't share the same truths. Same news. Uh, right. And, and that, uh, that distills down to the news, the news station, the news outlets that uh, we all, we all, you know, there's the Fox News Nation and, 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 news news distribution to the right of that and then there's the left-leaning news and stuff like that and and um, and you can google something the example in the movie was climate change and depending on where you are geographically you're going to get something completely different it will it will um the news will be fed to you according to where you are geographically so and also your buying habits and and, and in the places you've gone online and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so, so basically they show you how you're being manipulated. It's such yeah. a it's such a powerful film. I saw it and I was Now this is something uh, this is something that can be addressed uh through legislation. Um and really begs to be addressed through leg legislation, but it won't be as long as it's working for one party, for instance. And uh, if this election works out like it's looking like it might work out, then we might have a, an opportunity to, uh, to wade in and, uh, and, and, and start it, uh, get our, our representatives to, uh, to address the situation. And uh, you know, there's, there are a number of us on this call, for instance, who, uh, who you know, no people in DC, which which is where it would happen, and also it's at a state level, and um, and Christ, uh, democracy is a chore, but it's a it's a duty also, and uh, and it's it's something that we just have to shoulder. It's a it's a burden we have to shoulder and uh, and do, and it's not that huge. A, uh, it's not that huge a burden. And like we are shouldered to the wheel. Yep, it's, it's <laughs> something we got to do, like the, like the uh, the clown just said. Okay, well, thanks, thanks for your kind attention. Thank you, Bob Ooh. and Tasha. You're doing Thank amazing you. work. Thank you so much. I kiss your feet. Um, <laughs> so in in wavy song, back to the song. Wouldn't it be swell if people didn't sell their Mother Earth? which brings me to my dear friend, my Shiro, artist and activist, Deanna Cohen, co-founder of the Plastic Pollution Coalition. Um, 11 years ago, it started, which I am a proud executive board member from the, mostly from the beginning. And I see Jackson Brown is here, who is also on the board. Um, 
Plastic Pollution Coalition is a growing global alliance of more than 1,200 organizations, businesses, and thought leaders in 75 countries working toward a world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impact on humans and the environment. Diana, what is the relationship between the use of plastic, plastic pollution, and climate change? I'm glad you asked me, Michelle. You know, I, I, it's such an honor to be sitting here with you guys talking about these things that are all, it's, I'm so moved by everything everyone said already, but I have to say everything is really interconnected. And I'm hoping that we'll look at this year, 2020, as a year that we really were able to open our eyes and see the intersectionality between all of these different issues and no longer just say, oh, this person's an environmentalist, you know, to, to silo things so that people only care about one thing or another. It's all interconnected. We can't, we're part of nature. We can't exist without nature. And when we look at the issue of plastic and it's been plastic pollution, it's been a really sharp learning curve for me coming as an artist who was working with plastic bags and these materials to make my artwork and then slowly learning about the material and the impact of the material, and then realizing how ubiquitous it is and how it's in every facet of our lives somehow in beautiful colors. And it actually has certain funny aesthetic values to it as well. In seeing that and then coming to be a part of a group of people who created Plastic Pollution Coalition, who created the Break Free From Plastic movement, having the honor to be involved with the film, The Story of Plastic, learning more and more and seeing this connection between the fact that plastic is primarily made from petroleum and byproducts of processing petroleum and fossil fuels. So as we look at that whole desire to move away from and divest from fossil fuels and focus our energy into clean energy, solar, wind, uh, water, geothermal, in that same moment, we now see that plastic and our use of plastic and our dependence on it for packaging for all of our food and beverages and beauty products, or not all of them, but many of them, and our health products, that this is poisoning us, that this is making us sick. And it goes across the entire chain from extraction through manufacturing, production, our use of it, if it's single use for a very short amount of time. And then it's instantly a waste management issue. And a lot of the way that's handled is open burn in the United States, in different parts of the United States or incineration, incinerators, it's burnt and it creates particulate pollution and releases dioxins. We're basically polluting ourselves on that entire chain and the production of plastic creates greenhouse gases. So on all these different source points, it's not only creating toxics for us, toxins, but um, it's also you know, poisoning our water, poisoning our air. We're now finding microplastics in all these different, in salt, in honey, in beer, in the air, in our water, in bottled water. Uh, and so when you look at all of that and then you really dial down, I mean, for this year has really opened my eyes and all of us in the movement to the fact that the whole issue also disproportionately impacts lower income communities, communities of color, indigenous communities and, and weakens us and has been associated with different health issues. And these, when they compromise us in some way also make us more susceptible to a pandemic. So it's, it's just been an incredible year, again, in terms of coming to realizations and how all of this is so interconnected and the work, the great work that everybody here is doing and people around the world are doing to address it and to look for positive solutions, alternative materials, help scale things up, help support them and policy and legislation. So there's all kinds of great stuff happening. I don't mean to sound like a total downer <laughs> on the subject, but this is really a year to, I think if you're able to, if you're in a position where you, uh, where you can slow down for a moment and, and think about it and see these connections, 
it's going to be a very, very important year. I mean, it is already, but I think in retrospect, it will be one of the most important years of our lives. Thank you, Diana. Sure. You're amazing and never, you never ever sound like a downer. <laughs> Only an upper. <laughs> Diana, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Something so the song says, not just churches, not just steeples, give me peoples helping peoples. Seth Fleischer and Dr. Emily Baldwin are the co-founders of Walk the Walk 2020 and the parents of two budding activists. They had an epiphany back in 2016 when they couldn't explain to their boys how an openly racist, misogynistic bully had won the highest office. In that moment, Walk the Walk 2020 was born. Yeah. I will look at a video for a moment. Walk the Walk 2020 was born when we woke up on November 9th, 2016 and asked, how could we not have done more? This all volunteer initiative is our answer. The Democratic Party has long neglected our base, especially African-American and Latinx voters. And these are the communities that are disproportionately affected by Republican voter suppression. There are reasons lots of people don't vote. If we support communities, we expand the electorate and the conversation and we will win. There are far more eligible voters of color in swing states than Trump's margin of victory. So Walk the Walk partnered with 12 amazing grassroots groups like New Georgia Project and Voces de la Frontera. In just four months, we raised two and a half million dollars and fully funded those groups. And now we've identified a dozen Democrats running in flippable state legislative districts. Competitive, underfunded candidates of color who are reaching out to voters that traditional campaigns have ignored. So much attention goes to overfunded, high-profile races. But small investments in these campaigns will turn out Democrats to vote all the way up the ballot and help finally realize the democracy that we aspire to. Come, Come walk, walk the walk, walk with, with us. us. Yes. Bravo. Emily and Seth, please tell us a little more about your work with Walk the Walk 2020 and what you may have learned that can give us some hope right now. Thanks so much, Denise. Great to be with you and with all of you today. Um, this is a story of what I'd call um, accidental activism. Uh, you know, we didn't set out to create a new initiative, but the more we researched, the clearer it became just how much money uh, is in this system going to a small number of top of the ticket candidates. And they're often candidates who can't lose uh, or can't win. Um, and it's much more money than can be used impactfully, uh, you know, and so a lot of it goes to, for example, expensive TV ads that, are, you know, they're, they're not even shown to be terribly effective. So we wanted to really base the strategy on data. Um, you know, research shows that what is most effective is what's called relational organizing. So people engaging others who know and trust them. Um, and it's especially true among groups that historically have been left out of the political conversation, um, specifically Black and Latinx communities that really are the base of the Democratic Party. So it, you know, it turns out that the best way to win was, um, was to support and engage politically neglected communities. And the best way to do that, it turns out, is to invest in grassroots groups that are already deeply embedded in those communities and have a strong track, or, track record of success. Um, so, you know, on the, so, so on the geographic side, we identified particular regions of key swing states that have really important nested races so that if we turn out a single Democratic voter, um, they can vote in competitive races all the way up and down the ballot, not, you know, not just for, um, for president, so they can vote for really important state legislature seats and U.S. House seats that are competitive and, of course, Senate and, and Senate seats in the presidency. So then on the efficacy side, we wanted to look at, at, um, at groups with expertise in relational organizing um, that were reaching out to voters remotely in light of the pandemic. And so based on this, we identified 12 just really incredible grassroots groups um, that met all of these criteria and had an urgent need for funding. In October, just a few weeks ago, uh, beginning of October, when we closed our partners' funding gaps, we decided to put together a slate of 12 equally amazing candidates, uh, all people of color in these same key districts who met the same criteria and were significantly underfunded. 
And then the other thing we've done, which is we're so excited about just over the last few weeks is we built a volunteer platform that matches these candidates, many of whom are, you know, they're just scraping by um, with no, literally no staff, matching these candidates with graphic designers and strategists and artists. We have a huge artist community that's involved in this. Um, and they're donating their expertise to things like website development and leaflet design and even campaign strategy in a number of cases. Oh, whoa. So, so what's been amazing, so much has been amazing about this and, and Seth and I could go on and on, but we won't. Um, but you know, as, as Seth said, we didn't really set out to do any of this. We set out to try to understand for ourselves what would be the most effective thing to do. And then what we learned as we kind of got more into it, as Seth explained, was that the most effective thing, the, the single best way to beat Trump also turned out to be the most ethical thing. And, and when you stop and think about that, it actually is so obvious that what works is to make sure in these very specific ways that everybody has a voice and that those of us who have the resources to do so can donate resources to support those communities that have been systematically left out of the conversation. And, and what we, because initially we had thought maybe we would fly somewhere and go canvassing ourselves in Arizona or something. And what we realized was that people in those communities all over this country, they, they don't need me to fly in there. They know what they need. Um, and people of color in our country, they're well aware of the ways that they've been out, left out of the conversation. And so how we could make a difference, we discovered was instead to support groups in those communities that could bring people into these conversations and bring people into the voting booth. And also beyond that, and as people were alluding to this, it doesn't end in November, also help those same communities learn how to hold these elected officials accountable to actually build long-term democracy. This is not just about one candidate or one campaign. And so what we've heard from our partners every day is that the funding that we've brought in is helping them to reach more voters than they've ever been able to reach before. And they are combating voter suppression in real time. Um, and it's it's day-to-day -day work. It's far removed from any presidential debate or any fancy ad from the Lincoln Project, but it really is the embodiment of democracy. It's just been so inspiring to see. And, and I'd say one of the most inspiring things is that our you know, they are reaching people who have never been asked to participate before. Um, so we can see this, Bob talked about it, impact uh, in the lines for early voting. And in the fact that more people of color and youth will have voted early this year than voted in the entire 2016 election. We just heard just about an hour or two ago from our partner Texas Organizing Project that more African Americans have already voted in Texas than in the 2016 election. And in Harris County, the seat of Houston, um, they've already surpassed their 2008 and 2012 total turnout numbers. Yeah. Just in That's incredible. incredible. So this is our, this is our word of, uh, you know, our voice of hope. Um, you know, we're all, I know, flip-flopping between hope and incredible anxiety, but, but at this moment, I think what we know just from the work that we've been doing is that whether we win or lose and, and God knows we must win, <laughs> but whether we win or lose, something amazing is happening this year. And, as much as we hear on the news about division and we see division in our country, there's also an incredible movement towards collaboration. And we in Walk the Walk 2020, we've been so humbled to support these groups that have been on the ground in underrepresented communities for years and to support them in ways that have really allowed them to reach their potential with voters of color. And so our connections with those communities that are you know, demographically, geographically very different from our own has been incredibly inspiring, awe-inspiring. And then as well, the other piece that we didn't really mention was that we've also built our own community through bringing people onto these calls that we've been doing and bringing people into our Walk the Walk network. Um, we've recognized these connections with people all over the country. Um, you know, we have a donor base of over 4,000 people now. And as Seth mentioned, we've raised, you know, two and a half million dollars uh, upwards of that at this point all calling in from around the country determined that we're not going to give up on the promise of this country and realizing that we have to do something. And that's why we named our initiative Walk the Walk. So we have just a few more days left. Um, we post if people are interested to learn more about what we're doing. We have at our website, walkthewalk2020.org. We've got a daily calendar of opportunities to volunteer for our incredible candidates and our organizations. Uh, and we invite you all and, you know, everybody's doing so much, but we invite people to join us and, um, just to make sure that everybody, as everybody here is talking about, that everybody's finding their own peace in this crazy, complicated American democracy that we're all in. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Emily and Seth.
Nice. So it's yeah. a, a joy to be part of Walk the Walk 2020. Before we go to our final uh, guests, Trudy and Jack, um, Jackson, you made it. <laughs> and so awesome. I, I just, if you want to unmute yourself and just comment on anything, we're so glad to have you here. You know, you didn't think you could do it, but do you want to say yeah. something? Yeah. Okay. I don't have to speak. I'm really happy to hear what you all have to say. And I really didn't want to miss it for that. And I'm sorry I couldn't plan to be here. I am, you can consider me an emissary or an ambassador from that part of the population that is swirling and, 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 and encountering all these problems in multiple fronts and is over, overwhelmed by all of them. So I, I came for <laughs> the inspiration of hearing what you have to say and I'm, you know, I'm grateful, you know, to, to get to hear all of what you just said. And I just so moved uh, by all of it and, and um, especially walk the walk because I, I think that really is, that's, that's sort of like a new veil being lifted from me that, yeah, as, as important as these high profile pivotal races are, we really have to build that kind of movement that, was, that, that our opponents began in, in that same way. You know, school boards and state representatives and, you know, and water boards and all these, um, all these aspects of our d democracy that are being eroded by the uh, Alex Fund and the COPE, you know, the, the being supplanted by that kind of uh, activism on the right. So anyway, I, I, I'm, I salute you all. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to face these fronts on a very personal level in my life right now, especially I've got, I've got homeless members in my family. It's so much, it doesn't have to, that much to do with money and uh, more to do with mental health and the idea that so much of our system doesn't serve everybody. And the idea that, and if we can, the degree to which we can turn from our own ambition and acquisition and the good life that we all embrace for ourselves and our family, I mean, we really have to serve everybody, all of humanity and all of the children are our children and everybody's children are ours. And so uh, the, more I, the more I interact and, and, and try to serve and help my family member who has these problems, the more I see how deep the homelessness has affected our entire culture and how I mean, everywhere you look, I live in Los Angeles, so everywhere I look there are these encampments and people under bridges and just next, just on the sidewalk and, you know, and uh, they all deserve the kind of dignity that, um, that was mentioned earlier, you know, those people that you see in your, in your, of course now you're supposed to say six feet <laughs> from everybody, but if you, so maybe six feet instead of five feet, but I mean just the way in which you look into each other's faces and say, I see you. I recognize that we're, we're both here. And uh, so, so happy to, that I could make this and uh, this, this meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Jackson. Um, I was gonna, I wanted to add one little thing as we were talking to the environmental area, particularly there's a film I didn't do this check out. It's free. It's on YouTube. It was made by Patagonia Film and Jean-Claude Trinard and Robert Redford. And it's called Public Trust. And it's about the taking... Denise, Denise we, sorry, we just started to be able to hear you. So oh. you could you start over? I will. Thank you, honey. Wow. Um, I wanted to just add a little footnote when we're looking at um, our Mother Earth that there's a film called Public Trust that was made by Patagonia Films. It's free on YouTube. You can just go there and watch it. And it's about the eroding or the conscious taking of our public federal lands. Um, and it's really amazing, worth seeing public trust on, on, on YouTube. Thank you. Um, okay, so our final guest today are Trudy Goodman and Jack Cornfield. They are Dharma teachers, activists, and beloved friends of the Ace of Cups. 
And Mary Gannon, I know you have a question for Trudy and Jack. Let's let's hear that. Yeah. Well, I woke up the other day with this line, deep down in the garden. That line on the song, deep down in the garden, where no one is apart. Deep down in the garden, the garden of your heart. And when I look at recent things, events happening like Amy Barrett's Supreme Court confirmation uh, or acceptance of white supremacist militias, gerrymandering, cutting short the census, voter suppression, pandering to dictators and abandoning our allies, decimation of environmental protections and encouragement of cruelty, violence and racism not to mention the 500 children in Mexico whose parents can't be found from Mexico. I feel when looking at all these things, confusion, anger, and deep grief. Trudy Goodman and Jack Cornfield, I'm hoping you will share some wisdom about holding all of this and still being down in the garden of our hearts. Thank you, Mary. So good to, to hear your words. And, and, and some of them I actually wrote in an email to Denise, who was kindly not going to ascribe them to me as the leader of a nonprofit who's supposed to, you know, we're supposed to be, anyway, not engaged in political work. But as a, as a person, I can. Um, anyway, thank you. And Jack's going to speak first, and then I'll chime in. I'm just so pleased and touched the garden of my heart is like budding and growing and blooming with with Larry and Wavy and Jahara and Denise and Michelle and everybody who's spoken. So um, already there's something nourishing. And Trudy and I were out in an RV in the desert uh, last week and the week before at, you know, the Grand Canyon and out, out in Escalante. And at night when it's clear, and you can look at the canopy of stars, the, you know, and you look into that canopy and there's, of course, there's somewhere between 200 billion and a trillion galaxies. Uh, Wavy probably counted them, I don't know, he has a number. Um, each one of which has 100 or 200 billion stars. And it just stops my mind and I go, okay, there's a vastness here the turning of the seasons, the turning of life that we're a part of that's so much bigger. And it turns out the heart is as big as that. It can hold all of that. And we've been through this before as humanity, we've been through pandemics and earthquakes and typhoons and floods and, and injustice and dictators. And Mahatma Gandhi puts it this way for those who are discouraged. He says, when I despair, so here's Gandhi despairing like many who have in these last years. I remember that all through history, the way of truth and love has always won. Yes, there have been murderers and tyrants and for a time they can seem invincible, but in the end, they always fall. Think of it always. And we're part of some great turning like the Ojibwe say, Sometimes I go about pitying myself when I'm being carried by great winds across the sky. We know how to do this. We know how even in my childhood, there weren't very many homeless people, not until Ronald Reagan, you know, shut down public housing and things like, we know how to do this. And the suffering is not the end of the story. Just as Larry and others found out in ending, in ending smallpox. So they say in Zen, there are only two things. You sit and you tend the garden and it doesn't matter how big the garden is. And that is you take your time, you walk out and look at the stars. You have a communion with the, you know, maple tree in your yard and with the, where we live with the coyotes that run around or the, you know, the, the wildlife around you, whatever it is, the birds. and and you listen to something much bigger than politics. And then you open the door, the sweet oil that eases the hinge into the garden of your heart by meditation and quieting your mind and, and listening inside to what you really care about with our friend Ram Dass's 
quality of loving awareness. Not only do you bring in loving awareness, I see wavy nodding, but as Ram Dass would say, you are loving awareness. That's actually loving awareness beaming at you from this screen, from all these eyes and all these hearts together. And so you tend your heart and then once you've sat, you tend the garden, you get up with that heart that's in touch with the beauty of life, the unbearable beauty of life, along with the ocean of tears, there's this unbearable beauty. And you begin to plant seeds and you nourish them. And here's Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, who says, the heart is like a land planted with many different kinds of seeds, seeds of joy and peace and mindfulness, understanding and love, and seeds of craving and anger or fear and hate and forgetfulness. These unhealthy and healthy seeds are always there, sleeping in the soil of the heart. The quality of your life depends on the seeds you water. If you water a seed of peace in your heart, peace will grow. The seeds of happiness in you are watered, and when they are, you become happy. When the seed of anger in you is watered, you become angry. The seeds that are watered frequently are those that grow strong. Teach one another to tend the garden of the heart and to water the beautiful seeds that you were born with. Now, one more thing to say. Our inspired and, for me, great heroine act activist Molly Ivan says, keep fighting for freedom and love and justice, beloveds, but don't forget to have fun doing it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Wavy. <laughs> Seconding Molly Ivins, Wavy and Molly. Give and so a secret. <laughs> you paid your money, you waited till the end, you heard everybody speak. Now you want the secret, right? The secret is to act beautifully without attachment to the fruits of your actions. To plant beautiful seeds, to water them, and to begin to trust, this is from Thomas Merton, the mystic, who yep. said to the discouraged activist, do not depend on the hope of results. You may have to face the fact that your work will be apparently worthless at times, and sometimes even bring about its opposite. And as you get used to this, you start more and more to concentrate, not on the results, but on the truth, the rightness, the value of the work itself. And so you begin to plant seeds after you quiet the mind and feel the vastness that you are a part of and realize that when you plant those seeds, they will eventually bear fruit. Every voter that is registered, every beautiful muse song that is sung, everything that touches the heart is your heart connected with all the others. And so Henry David Thoreau ends reminding us, though I do not believe that a plant will spring up where no seed has been, I have great faith in a seed. Convince me that you have a seed there and I am prepared to expect wonders. Mm. And you are the one who makes wonders out of your heart. Quiet it, tend it, and get up to this garden, plant and water. Miss Trudy, dear. Thank you, my beloved. Jack. Thank you. That what was so you beautiful. To... So beautiful. Uh, yeah, that was really beautiful. One of the things, you know, Jack mentioned that we were out in, um, we we're actually in the canyons of southern, southeastern, southwestern, southern Utah. And yes, to see those layers, those form, rock formations of geologic time and realize you can see the layer that was the bottom of the ocean millions of years ago. It does help put things in perspective. But at the same time, I couldn't help but notice, you know, we stayed, we rented an RV, we stayed in some RV parks before we got the hang of, we don't have to do that. But in the, all the RV parks, all the national parks, I saw almost, no black or brown people. The only black person I ran into was a lady in the shower when we were in the shower together um, in one of the RV parks in Las Vegas. And it just made me, um, it just made me realize and appreciate the importance of, 
uh, well, I, the work that Walk the Walk is doing and that for all of us to remember that um, just how deeply rooted in our culture, and it did not start with this administration as we know, uh, these forces of white privilege, of white supremacy, um, the collective just privilege and impact of whiteness that we sometimes forget about. This is so, it's just so important to remember. And when we talk about, uh, I loved that you talked about collaboration, Seth and Emily, because when we talk about unity, sometimes there's this feeling of um, that which unites us is so much more consequential than that which separates us, but it's really important not to annihilate the differences between us as well. And uh, that it's really about collaboration across differences and not trying to say we're all the same because that sameness is usually colored by our whiteness <laughs> and assumption that everybody wants the same thing and everybody doesn't necessarily. Um, and one of the things that we've been working on a lot um, in the meditation center that I founded inside LA is attention to diversity and inclusion. In the garden of my heart, yes, there's room for everybody. There's room, there's, there's diversity of every kind, um, political, sexual, gender identification, race, all the identities and isms. Um, there's room for everybody. And at the same time, is there inclusion in my life, in my embodied existence? Inclusion means that everybody might feel that they belong together, that they belong in a space together and that they are safe there and they can be at ease there and they can express themselves freely there. So these are things that um, for the garden of the heart to be manifest in our society, this is what we're all working toward. And this is what I'm so inspired by listening to all of you and working in your own way, in your own spheres. And yes, connected, all of it intersecting, like Deanna said. And I do want to give another shout out for the social dilemma. Um, our friend Tristan Harris, who is the star of that movie, has been like a lone voice crying in the wilderness for years and now finally people are listening and it's a really important, um, it's a really important film. So yeah, building community together through doing whatever the practices that we do, of course, our practices of meditation and mindfulness and self-compassion and loving kindness. And these are the ways that we can um, tend the garden of our heart restore our sanity amidst the swirl of everything that Jackson was naming and, and, and feeling. And I think another piece that's, um, that's important for me is the inspiring stories of people who really do change, like the story of C.P. Ellis, who was a Ku Klux Klan member and who had to work together because of a federal grant requirement with a leader of the black community on uh, issues having to do with their schools. And over time, these two who hated each other came to discover that poor black people and poor white people have way more in common and nobody really wants them to get together and realize that and, um, and work for social change. So those stories inspire me. And, and I think what also inspires me are the practices that we teach because we also do them. And for me to be able to take a moment to step back and to ah, take a deep breath and actually tune into my heart helps me know what's there, find my voice, and also find the courage to speak the truth. And that's one of the tensions that I'm holding right now, as I mentioned, you know, being the representative in a leadership role in a nonprofit. How much can I really say of what I feel? And yet there's something so liberating and so freeing about not denying, about actually speaking uh, with all the passion and intensity that we feel about the issues that we care about. Um, so I just am really grateful to listen to everybody, to feel inspired by your work and your stories 
and to be in the company. I just want to give also a shout out to Denise because as I look through the Zoom tiles at all of you, my connection to almost everybody is through you, Dee. And I'm so grateful to you. It's either you or Ramdas. So I'm really grateful to you and for inviting us. And I'll let Jack end with some of Jack's beautiful words. Well, I'm remembering um, one of those great moments that happened something like 50 years ago at Woodstock when uh -huh. When Wavy was there in his memorable statement about breakfast in bed for 450,000 people. Um, and now what I see on the screen and what I feel in the big hearts that have come together is this is breakfast in the heart, a new beginning <laughs> in the heart, you know, for seven and a half billion people served by Wavy Gravy and all of the rest of you in the form of music and art and love and politics and the tending of the great garden that we share of this shared heart. Thank oh, you. Kelly's hump is full of seeds. <laughs> <laughs> Wavy, what do you say about a sense of humor? If you don't have a sense of humor, it just isn't funny anymore. <laughs> Or if you don't laugh, you'll end up with. What? Your brain to, to <laughs> oh, brain. your beans and your brains on the ceiling. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few. Uh, my favorite wavy quote is, we're all the same person just trying to shake hands with ourselves." Thank you so much, Trudy and Jack. That was so nourishing. Um, so nourishing. I needed that. And I know we all did. Um, we need to remember that it's going to be okay. And this too shall pass. And um, thank you. Um, so I want to thank everybody, Dallas, Denise Kaufman, Diane Bidlich, Mary Gannon Alfier, Denise Sandoval, Natasha and Bob, Seth Fisher and Emily Baldwin, Wavy Gravy and Jahanara Romney, Buzz. Trudy Goodman and Jack Cornfield, Mary Ellen Simpson Mercy. Dr. Larry Brilliant, Woo. Jackson Brown, Deanna Cohen, and Rachel Ann. And please stick around as we have some closing words to share in the premiere of the ACES Next video, Sister Ruth. Ooh. Rachel Ann, take it away. Okay, we have. Wow, I um, I haven't been inspired in a long time because there's so much going on that you're bombarded with that it's hard to find the place for it. And listening to all of you and the work you're doing in the world, um, that was really amazing. I hope all of you watching at home are inspired to learn more and do more and activate the garden of your heart. Michelle, thank you so much. For those of you that don't know, right before this, Michelle had her own event She's hosting these incredible conversations um, about healing and trauma and just she's doing some amazing work in the world. So you can find out more and keep up with what she's doing at crackedupmovie.com. Highly recommend, Michelle, you're changing lives and saving lives. And she literally popped in from one Zoom to our Zoom. So I thank you. Thank you for taking this on and joining us. You are super special. Um, we'd also like to thank George Wallace and our label at High Moon Records, who really are just an incredible team of people to work with. They've put out two incredible albums with the Ace of Cups. We couldn't be luckier as artists and musicians and, and as their unmanager, as the Ace like to call me, because these women are super independent. So we call me their unmanager because they are not manageable. Um, but we are so lucky to be on this label. So George and Lucas and Pat and Alan and Jay, thank you so much. Um, the new album, Actually Sing Your Dreams, that just came out is where you can find the track, Basic Human Needs. So we hope you will enjoy 
um, checking that out, you can find it on our website. Um, and thank you again to all of our guests. You're truly inspiring. And if you want to find out more about each of the organizations, we'll put something up on our Facebook. Um, and then here is actually a really cool slide about organizations you can help in the next few days. So it's not too late to make a difference. So walk the walk 2020, headcount.org, swingleft.org, and movement.vote. If you visit some of their websites, they've got all sorts of things you can do from home, phone banking, door knocking, calling, texting. So if you have some time, uh, please do check out what they're working on. It is not too late to make a difference. And then um, last and not least, uh, we're just, again, so grateful. And we had this song that Denise wrote, I can let her speak to it a lot, you know, about Sister Ruth. And we put it on the album. And then as we were listening to it, when Ruth Ginsburg died, Denise and I were like, you know what, we should do something really beautiful in her honor. So we're so excited to world premiere our video of Sister Ruth, RBG. We are on it. And I promise you, we will make you proud. We will finish your work. We've got this. And together we will make this world that we all wanna live in. And thank you guys, everyone for coming. Don't forget to go to our website. You can go to Facebook, learn more about the great people that are here. And Denise, if you wanna tee up Sister Ruth, Pamela will play it when you're done. And thank you so much again, everyone for joining us for this very, very special evening. Thank Thanks you. Yeah. I just wanna say Sister Ruth is a song that uh, was written a long time ago, but uh, I think any, any woman named Ruth harkens back to the Ruth in the Bible. And this was inspired by the story of Ruth in the Bible. And it's a story of her story is a story of loyalty and uh, sticking with someone. Um, and uh, so that's the inspiration for the song. Um, Ruth was, didn't abandon her mother-in-law when, when her husband died and when all the men in the family died and Ruth went with her and said, I, I'm not gonna let you go. I'm not gonna let you wander off alone. Um, your people are my people and I will stay with you forever. So that was the beginning seed inspiration of the song. I hope you enjoy it. It's really also a lot about what's going on in our world with children all over the world and families. So enjoy. And one quick shout out to Pam for running the back end. Thank oh, you so much, thank you. I know this never works as easy as we'd like it to. And also a shout out really quick, I forgot to save your stages. Really important. There's a lot of people who work on the back end of all the concerts and entertainment that have not been working for months. So if you can support the organizations that are helping the people that make entertainment possible, the roadies, the managers, the staff, the bartenders, try to see if there's room to um, help support some of those organizations that are really focused on helping the entertainment world and the people who make things like this happen. So thank you, Pam. Thank you, everyone. And Sister Ruth, this is for you. Sister Ruth, so many years ago She said, where you may be going, I will go Whoa, my sister, can we do less today? When the balance hangs, it could go either way Waters have been stirred Can the songs of love and freedom still be heard? Whoa, my brother, have we gone far astray? When the balance hangs, it could go either way rock a -bye, that little child Sleeping in his mama's arms Tokyo to Mexico From here to Lebanon Will he have shelter in a storm? A place to play and grow One human family, you know We all know Life may be a moment long You turn around, find that moment 